Welcome to Shoreline Conversations. This is episode 16, and we are back with uh, Pastor Dennis, and we're talking about tactics. Last week, we went over the first uh, official tactic, the Colombo tactic. It's all about asking the right questions and conversations about what we believe. And uh, we ended off there uh, with a little bit of a cliffhanger, a, a, a transition into our next tactic, which is self-destructing views. So let's just jump right into it. Uh, Dennis is here with us. Um, can you give us first, before we, I guess before we jump right into it, I should say, uh, give us a brief uh, recap of where we're at. What, what's uh, a brief recap of the Colombo tactic so we can so we can more uh, better be better equipped to enter our next tactic here. Okay, so we're modeling the tactic of Lieutenant Colombo and we're using a easy access, self-effacing way of getting engaged in a conversation with someone who has made an assertion. They've made a claim about something that's really, really important to look at. It's really um, a significant claim, a truth claim. And in these, in the case of which we're discussing, it has something to do with a belief about Christianity and God. So we want to explore it with them. And the first tactic we use, if they they mention God or anything they mention the claim, we'll pick those parts of the claim we want to know more about and say, what do you mean by that? And what do you mean by that? What, what are you saying, you know, there? I want to make sure I understand your, your viewpoint. And so we welcome that, and we have them give us that view, and we check it out to make sure we have it right. Then the next tactic is, so how did you get there? How did you come to that conclusion? What's kind of the, the route you took in your thinking or your, in your world, your, your, your life, somehow to get there? Because here's where you said you are. How'd you get there? And so we want to honor the journey, learn about the journey. This is a human being. I want to know how they think, how they got here. And then, of course, the third tactic, we, we use more questions to make a point. We use questions to point out absurdity, errors, and logic. And we, But in a gentle way, we don't say, you've got an error in your logic, you, <laughs> which would likely be less effective. But we point out things that don't work well. And now we're talking about Sentences that people use are the ways th they construct an assertion that we can show that it easily self-destructs. Mm -hmm. And a, a silly example might be, I just want to say to you, I never, ever, ever, ever say the word never more than once in a sentence. Yep. Well, well all, said. We'd have, all we'd have to do is say, well, I just noticed that you said it five times. Their own sentence self-destructed itself. We just pointed out its self-destructive property. Yep, and that's that, and this tactic, uh, self-destructing views, really, uh, really comes straight out of the th uh, the third sub tactic of Colombo. <laughs> this is getting complicated. Uh, yeah. It's it's as you're pointing out. Uh, say you're still in the Colombo. You're still in that third question, and you're pointing out absurdities. Uh, uh, this tactic specifically is is kind of one of the ways that might look. Is that a, is that a, a fair way of looking at it, that, yeah, that so. self-destructing views might be one of the examples uh, right. that you get from the third stage of the Colombo tactic? Right, yeah. Perfect. So <clears throat> what uh, the power of listening is, is big in this. You're not going to be able to pick out the self uh, self-destructing views, self-refuting views, however you want to you, you want to put it. If you haven't really, really listened, so how do we? What are some tips you have to really key in on on phrases? I know that like we don't uh, people. I'm generalizing here. Maybe I'm the only one, but people really uh, often don't think about like language in an argument. It's it's often just about the points rather than the language that's used. How, how does really listening to the language that's being used as you're getting responses from these questions uh, play into this, uh, this, this next tactic, the, the self-refuting views? Well, it's absolutely critical to listen. You, you said it right. We have to listen. And when listening, uh, well, we're tracking. And when I track, it means I'm 
I have these questions just in a filter in my mind. I'm thinking, what are they saying? Why do I think they're saying it? What do they seem to be feeling as they say it? What do I think they mean as they say it? I'm tracking. I need all that information. It's exactly the kind of tracking we want to do in a relationship. Mm -hmm. So by this point, I've committed to this engagement with this person. Listening to them is one of the most powerful gifts I can give them right now. And, you know, a secondary effect, and Coco doesn't talk about this particularly, it's not his deal, but this is something that, that I notice is by, like we said earlier, uh, someone giving their point of view, most people are never asked for their point of view, so it's honoring. But l being listened to uh, can lead to being understood. And being understood leads to being valued. I have an opportunity to listen in such a way that this person will know whatever side of the fence we end up on, they're valued in this conversation. You can value a person and not agree with anything they're saying. Mm. And as a Christian, that's part of my responsibility, even in something like this. So listening really well is a gift we give another person. And in order to listen well, I have to put my own my own biases about what they're saying aside, my own instant instinctive responses of, with my opinions aside, and try to take them in. Try to take them in. Otherwise, I'm just saying, no, there's things I, I want them to do and say, and I have to get them there. Right. Well, we do have somewhere we're going, and we are working to be persuasive. No question. But yep. I want to listen well. It's a tremendous gift to give somebody. And even if they walk away, not agreeing with you, um, you guys just don't see eye to eye or they don't want to talk anymore. You know what? You had the opportunity to briefly show the care of Jesus. Right. By this really caring about him. That has effect also. A little off topic, but since you mentioned it, uh, I mean, we talked about the stone in somebody's shoe last week. Um, rarely in conversations, uh, for better or worse, do people say, you know what, you got me, I admit it, I was wrong, I changed my mind. Even on a little thing, right? I'm not even talking about full conversion, but even on a little thing. I feel like more often than not, even if you did a great job, and even if you did exactly what you're supposed to do, the conversation will still end in, well, I just don't agree with that. And they'll walk away. Yeah. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you failed in putting that stone in their shoe. I feel like exactly. despite what they're saying, uh, I know I, I'm saying this because this is what I always end up doing. I always, I, I'll be in a big debate and, I, and I'll, even sometimes I'll feel like I won the debate. But then I'll go home and be like, man, there's that one point that they made that I just don't feel confident that I really dealt with. And, yeah. and you know, it goes on from there. So um, I guess uh, not a question, but what's an encouragement for people who are having these kind of, kinds of conversations when uh, it's almost like be prepared to feel like you're always failing, but you might not be. You know, what? I, I, I really love that. Uh, I have a couple of pers anecdotal things to share that remind me of this. One is I ran into a couple um, about eight years ago. I was doing a, eight or ten. I was doing a conference at a Silomar for a church in the Bay Area. And a couple came up to me that I hadn't seen in 20 years. I didn't even recognize them. They came up and said, Dennis, swap your R's. And that's a phrase I use for uh, respond rather than react. Okay. Swap your R's. I didn't even remember that. But somewhere, <laughs> somehow, in counseling with him, I had said that and taught him that. And he took it to heart. I didn't know that. I never heard from him again. So I feel like we need to leave this little space in us for this world of possibility and let the Lord work in that space. That's important. You just don't know. And so use that when you start that getting that feeling of failure, like I I I I lost this round, nothing good happened. Yeah. <clears throat> Leave a little margin in there. That's something that, that I try to do. The other thing about debates, I remember watching Nabil Qureshi, 
who's passed away. He's home with the Lord now, but he's a, a world-class debater. And he debated Shabir Ali, I think is his name, one of the top scholars in Islam. And it was at the Moody Bible Institute, and it was done professionally with a moderator, timelines, limits, all that, with a big crowd, and it was on the radio. And it was in video. I watched it two and a half hours. I think by the end, there was a majority that voted Nabiya won the debate. Shabir Ali did not convert to Christianity. <laughs> Shocking. So it's all lost. Right. You know what I mean? Yep. You, you, you win the debate. Maybe that serves like a stone in someone's shoe. Yeah. Yeah. It could come up years later. Uh, I know I've had yeah. conversations that, uh, have I've effectively effectively forgotten about until years later when some some phrase like the swapping the R's comes up. But anyway, <laughs> back to back to the uh, to the tactic. Um, now Kukul calls this tactic the the suicide tactic, which uh, not not the best choice of language. So it's uh, it's kind of it's it's kind of confusing when we say the self refuting tactic. We're not talking about uh, self refuting in our own uh, uh, selves. Right. But um, we're talking about looking out for self-refuting things. Now, Kukul breaks it down into three, once again, three kind of subcategories uh, of like formally, practically, and then the third one's called sibling rivalry. So we've yeah. talked a little bit about the formal uh, self-refuting views, but, but um, what does that exactly mean going forward here? The formal ones... Um they sort of express a concept that, that is very straightforward, but it simply can't work. For example, somebody might say, and, and one of my own family members said this recently, there is no truth. There's no truth. And so I could just say, is your statement true? <laughs> and it's like, oh. So, and it's interesting where they go with that if you make the, if you make that response. Or if somebody says, you can't know anything for sure. Nobody can know anything for sure. You could say, well, how do you know that for sure? Yeah. And so it, it exposes it immediately. It's a formal statement that really quickly and simply can't work. It doesn't work on any level. So, and and so there's in, a number of those. And in that sense, that's where we're really listening for what language people are using. We're, exactly. we're not looking for gotcha moments, but I feel like I, if I say something contradictory, I would hope somebody points it out because I don't want to <laughs> wanna continue to say that down the road. So yeah. in, a, in a graceful, respectful way, we're looking for for language contradictions that that cannot be true. You're right. And, you know, it's interesting because as we look for them, it's really heightened my sensitivity to my own use of language. I had no idea. I mean, I'm, I'm just as capable and guilty of all of this, of using words carelessly, meetings without, you know, any real uh, definition uh, and now I've become much more careful about it. But I had another family member. I have a big old family, extended family. Well, said, you know, um, and Coco experiences too. There are no absolutes. And I, I'd never thought this before, but, well, is that an absolute? <laughs> Absolutely not. You know, it's kind of like when Josh McDowell uh, mentioned why atheism can't be real. And I hadn't thought of it. He says, well, an atheist says there is no God. They don't ever say, I don't believe in God. They say God doesn't exist. There is no God. And McDowell says, to know that, you'd have to know everything. And if you knew everything, you'd be God. There you go. Well, that statement itself formally self-destructs. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. I feel like a lot of people will, will say something like that. And you will... Uh, through, through questions as kind of the tactics, that's kind of the thread that really follows through all of these. Through questions, we can draw out, uh, well, uh, like you said, there is no truth. Is, is that statement true? We can kind of yeah. highlight, okay, all right. Well, maybe they take a step back and um, maybe what they're trying to express, maybe there's more to it, but the language they've used is, uh, is problematic. And they take a step back and they reapproach and restate their their position um, in a way that maybe isn't technically a contradiction, but uh, is maybe practically a contradiction. And that leads us into the yeah. second. Uh, explain how that works. How we deal with practical self-refuting views. 
Well, yeah, that's helpful too. And by the way, um, I forgot to mention earlier that when someone's view doesn't hold up and it's only an assertion, then they're not going to be taken seriously. Mm -hmm. So that's important. If someone wants to be taken seriously. So next you're looking at practical self-destruction. Um, it's like, you know, you shouldn't force your morality on me is actually a, a, a morality forcing statement because they use the word should. Right. It's like, well, you just, you just exercise the very rule you told me I should never use. Yep. You know, um, you shouldn't tell people what they should do. Well, you just told me what to do regarding telling people what to do. That doesn't work at all. So I, I think if you can do this well, you can help a lot of people see their own maybe absurd humor in their own way of asserting things. Right. Man, you just say this stuff all the time, do you? <laughs> yeah. Well, that's that's a great... Um... I'm not sure how to express this, but but looking looking at words like should or you ought to do this, um, is there a value in uh, words like that? Keeping an ear out for words like that. There's there's probably more that I can't think of off the top of my head. I know that um, a lot of times in in uh, like uh, philosophy or whatever they're called the oughts because you ought to do this is uh, and is, shoulds. Yep, that's a specific. This is a specific morality statement. Right. Um, is there value in, in really maybe even getting writing down a list of words where uh, synonyms for ought and should that we look out for these kind of things? I, I think that's wise, uh, Thomas. And ought and should draw lines in the sand. Mm -hmm. They say there's only one response, correct response to this. And that introduces good, bad, right, and wrong. So that brings up another topic. What about folks who say, well, there is no morality. You know, this uh, or ethics are just what each person thinks they ought to be. Mm -hmm. and everyone should decide on their own morality, which in, is in itself a moral statement. Well, it was Aristotle himself said all laws are based on morality. It just depends on which rule of morality you select yep and you may select yourself i'm the i'm the bringer of my law and and my rules and my morality and yep. so that in itself when someone says you shouldn't do that the moment they say should it's not going to work so i agree with you if you're not doing an absolute because as a christian following scripture we we do believe in some absolutes we do we we have an idea very clearly of things that are right and things that are wrong yep but there's a great deal that operates outside of that and so i think we should have other words that more accurately describe what we're really saying and feeling because once you draw a line in the sand now you've started a fight at some level mm -hmm. oh yeah yeah oh yeah yeah <laughs> Here we go. So what's the question? What's the question? Say um, somebody gives you one of these uh, practically self-refuting views or or even in any context, they give you a should or an ought. They give you a moral statement that they may not even be aware that they just uh, went at you with. Uh, what's the question that we ask? What's the what's the where do we go from there? So, well, it depends on the particular type of question, but in general, if, if they if they say you, if in the example of you shouldn't force your morality on me, what question would I ask them? Before I ask the question, I would point something out mm -hmm. first. And I would say, so you've just used a moral position while at telling me I shouldn't use a moral position. Is there another way you'd like to say that? Right. Because the way you stated it, we can't work with. We, we don't have anywhere to go with that. So if they if they do say, well, I okay, yeah, fine, I am making a moral statement. Uh, is is that is that just kind of like we talked about in the previous episode where there be, there comes a wall where we just step back, 
Or is there a way we can take that? Is there a way we can? Well, there's a way we can take it. And it's actually one of the favorite things I, I, I get to do with these con conversations. I'll say, so you're, you're taking, let me make sure I have you right. You're taking a, a stand on this mm -hmm. in this moral position. Yeah, that's right. How did you get there? So we're and, back and to Columbo step two. Yes. What basis or what form, formative process happened to get you there? Got it. We're seeing, we're beginning to see how we can. So, th so these tactics aren't a straight line. No. So you, you get to a certain point and you can go back to the Columbo tactic and uh, it, it, it kind of revolves around. That's, that's a, uh, uh, an interesting way to look at it. I, I love it. Um, all right. So let's, let's get into the third subcategory of the self-refuting views. Uh, Kuku calls it sibling rivalry. What, what does that mean? What does he mean by that? Well, when he says that um, there are, there's a pair of concepts in one sentence that are logically inconsistent. Mm. They don't fit. So an example might be something like, um, how could God allow evil to exist? So those are, those are paired up concepts in one sentence and they oppose each other. Evil exists, so God doesn't. But if God does, evil shouldn't. So there's, there, there, it's a sibling rivalry, and they're logically inconsistent, inconsist and they oppose each other. One is saying the other can't exist, mm -hmm. but they put them in one sentence. So we begin to ask questions. When you say God, what do you mean by that? And when you say evil, what do you mean? And as they, if they give an explanation, we work with it. But with evil, for example, most people would say, well, harm to children. You know, it always is kids, I guess. Yep. Harm to kids or cancer to people. And, and I'll say, okay, so it's your view that God doesn't exist because there's painful, difficult, harmful things happening in the world. Now I would ask them, so let me tell you what you mean by God. What, what, what are you talking about when you say God? So again, I'm going to have them put all their pieces on the table. Mm -hmm. So if God exists, then now, now in this third tactic, I'm sharing more of the points I want to make. Okay. I, so you're starting to open points. up a little. Open it up. And I'm going to share more of the points I want to make in these questions. So I might say, so this, so, so you've said, how could a loving God, tell me what love is and what God is in your view, all right? And you're saying evil is in the world. So are you saying evil shouldn't be in the world? Yeah, it shouldn't be. I would then say, by what measurement, by what standard have you decided what's evil? And they might say, well, everybody knows. I mean, child abuse is evil. I would say, how did you come to the conclusion? By what standard do you believe that child abuse is evil? So they might say, well, it just is. I'd say, well, help me out here. Because are you saying that there's a standard others can see and adhere to? Mm -hmm. Because a while ago you said everybody does their own moral thing. Right. So it, it, So which one is it? And you're saying, so, so do you believe God gives people free choice or free will? The God you described. Or are you saying, you know, I've got all kinds of ways to go. Are you saying that there was no evil in the world by this standard, whatever you use, an objective moral standard to decide what abuse is or what's evil? Or how much of that would have to go away for you to believe in a loving God? All of it? And by what standard and measurement are you using? Right. So, because what happens is, Almost anybody who says evil in the world, if you ask questions and explore it, will let you know they don't even believe their own stance. They just don't. Yeah. I believe everyone decides what's good for them. Really? Then what's this thing you have with child abuse being bad? So this is where this is where knowledge of the subject, I feel like, really starts to kick in. At this point, you're a little beyond just the question asking, where you're really still asking questions but you're making statements 
with your question. So your example is the problem of evil, which is written about in books for for uh, oh. centuries. <laughs> um, there, there's what's the value in making sure once you get to this point, um, making sure you yourself don't enter into something that you are going to kind of say a, a whoopsie about, uh, uh, or maybe you, you do get there and you realize halfway through, uh, you, you know, their, their statement, you're like, uh Oh, I can't keep up. What do you do? What, what, what's, uh, what, where are we at that point? Well, if, if you feel like you can't keep up and this person's fully engaged, you feel like you're not in the driver's seat anymore. You're kind of on the hot seat. Maybe mm -hmm. it's really important to say something about that and not just ignore it and fight in a futile fashion. But I might say, all right, at this point, um, I, I'd love to hear more from you, but I wanna take what you share and I'm gonna take a break. There's some more things I'm gonna look into and I'd love to bring them back to you and have a further conversation. In other words, you still don't go to an argument and you leave on good terms if you have to leave. Right if you're not prepared and just say, you know, I'm really not prepared. I feel like I understand what I want to say, but I'm going to go get better prepared and I'd love to share it with you. Mm -hmm. I think that'd be a way to at least put it on hold, but with a capacity or an ability to get back to it. But, but I have to encourage everybody, everyone uh, watching this or listening to this. If this kind of thing is your deal, you really want to get good at this and explore this, this kind of apologetics do get informed about the most common issues people have with Christianity. In fact, we're going to be presenting some of this in the coming year in our apologetics track. I would encourage you to do that. I'm doing it because I love it, but I, I want to be there in the right spot at the right time in these conversations because it might be even a bigger rock in someone's shoe. Mm -hmm. Might be a rock in both shoes to be able to answer in such a way that the person really has to pause and look yep, and, and see the, their own, the absurdity in their own statements, but not in a self-defeating way or in you beat me in a debate way, but just pointing it out and have them come to that. So I've got to get equipped to do this well. I need to have some answers when I get to this point, because if I'm asking questions that take them to a place I think they need to go. I need to know what's in that place. Yep. Yep. And so last kind of point here, um, especially with that last one, the sibling rivalry, and especially with the example you used, how could a good God allow evil and suffering? Being able to pinpoint on the spot, okay, they made a, que they made a claim about God and they made a claim about evil. And evil right. being a, uh, a moral term, uh, which implies that they must have a moral system, which which uh, leads you to ask, uh, where do they get that moral system from if there is no God? You kind of go on this rabbit trail, but some people are like, man, uh, there's no way that I'm going to think of all those things on the spot. Uh, how does practice play into these things? How does practice play into these conversations? Because do we just, do we pull our friends in and say, hey, can I practice on you? Or, or do we just engage in these conversations and be okay that we're not going to be masters at it immediately? Well, I, I don't favor the latter. Okay. Because of the human tendency to forget. I, I, I'm a big believer that people who come to church regularly on Sunday within a year or two rarely hear a new topic. They really embrace being in an inspirational way reminded of what they already know and are firmly grounded in many. So I think practice is really important. And because apologetics is not a track the masses in, in the Christian world follow, we know that certain people are going to want to study tactics and want to learn these answers and do more and others won't. won't. So I, I, I would love people to find partners to practice with. And we put that challenge in the tactics class um, and said, you know, now you know who each other is are. See if you can pair up and practice this. And in fact, we're, we're writing and formulating a Tactics 2 class for the coming year in which we're going to do that very thing, create opportunities for practice online during the online sessions. 
two by two. So people can do that. You know, it's interesting, Thomas, I just did a brief training with our lay counseling team yesterday and reminded them that when you're counseling with folks who say, I want to change, I want to be different, very few people change permanently. And those who do either change from hard work daily or a cataclysmic event. Almost nobody changes from hearing a great message, reading a snappy book, or having a wonderful conversation. Mm -hmm. So if we know that going in, we, we want to practice and practice to master something you have to. You need a partner to practice with. You can do it on your own. That's okay. It's much better to partner and practice with someone else. But if you can't find someone, do practice on your own. But what do we know? 66 days. <clears throat> you want to master something? Do it to some extent every day for 66 days. To the extent you can do that, you'll get better and better at it. Now, because I've read this material, I've taught this material, we're doing the podcasts, I'm knowing it better and better, but I didn't know it well after the first read through. Right. It's not how it works. So I, I would echo that practice, practice and pray and ask God, is this something you want me to get good at? Yep. The yep. same way a worship singer prays. Do you want me to do this? It's a unique area in ministry. Yeah, it's very. It's a. This is an interesting. Uh, it's an interesting place. You know, we talk about the body of Christ, and uh, how a lot of people are gardeners, and uh, I think this probably excites a lot of people, and it probably terrifies a lot of people, uh, and and that's all right. But anyway, we got we got more tactics uh, in the in the coming episodes. Um, one called taking the roof off. We got the steamroller tactics, sticks and stones. Just the facts, ma'am. We got a bunch more taxes coming up, but for today, that's going to be it. Thank you once again, uh, uh, Dennis. And uh, uh, if, if you guys are interested in the classes that Dennis did, they're on our YouTube channel. I believe they're still linked on our website, but uh, yeah. they're definitely on our YouTube channel right on the front page. Um, so check those out. But we will be back with another uh, tactics episode next week. Thanks again, Dennis. Too much fun, Thomas. Thank you. All right. See you guys. Whether you're watching on our YouTube channel or listening on your podcast app, make sure to subscribe to hear more of our weekly episodes. Thanks for listening.